Well, good morning. We are in week number two of our series, Desire, Warning What God Wants. Desires, Warning What God Wants. And that's really the essence of the entire series, that last tagline there, Warning What God Wants. It's also a key component to experiencing God's best for you every single day. Getting to a place in your life where you want what He wants to give you, where you pray the things that He wants to give you. And last weekend, we learned regarding desires, we learned that they are powerful. As a matter of fact, we learned that desires have volcanic power, volcanic power. They influence everything that we do. Now, here's the really good news of what we learned last weekend. We get to decide how those desires influence our life. We choose. We get to pick how those desires shape our decisions and our choices, our relationships every single day. And this morning we're going to be looking at or transitioning from the power of desires to the problem of desires. The problem of desires. Now here's what culture will do. Culture will invite us to do what makes us look good, feel good, and what pleases self. Culture invites us to do what makes us look good, feel good, and pleasing self. Christianity, on the other hand, invites us to make choices in life that make Jesus Christ the hero of all that we do. And our desires play a huge role in that. And remember last weekend we talked about that our desires are God-given. They're God-given. But, but our enemy, Satan, would love to distort those desires. And we're really going to unpack that today. Now, the main idea I want you to take away this morning from our message this morning is that our desires should make our life better, not worse. They should usher us into the presence of God and the will of God. So our desires should make our life better, uh, not worse. But we have to be very careful here. We have to be careful because... Our desires can at times mislead us. They can be distorted, um, if you will. And so we have to be aware of that. We're going to unpack that here in, in just a few minutes. Now, here's what culture will do regarding your desires. Culture will bait you to the very edge of disaster. Culture will invite you to flirt, flirt, flirt. And culture will encourage you to ask unwise questions. Uh, this is an unwise question. What's the line that I can't cross? You know, a, a five-year-old asked that question. But as an adult, you get into trouble when you start dealing with that type of question. In other words, it looks like this. Exactly how much of this activity can I participate in until it's sin? And then at that point, it's game over. Uh, the, the enemy has you if, if, we're not, if we're not careful. So culture will bait us to the very edge of disaster. And then when we step over the line, it doesn't offer a helping hand, but rather a condemning stare. And we can do better than that. And our focal text this morning will help us be prepared to do better than that. Now, to tackle this subject of the problem of desires, we're going all the way back to where the problem began, the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, they just bought the sales pitch of the serpent, Satan, hook, line, and sinker. And as we look at this old familiar text, Genesis 3, 1 through 6 is the focal passage that we're going to be studying. We're going to read through verse 11. Now, if you're here Wednesday night, I'm not unaware if few of you were not because there were tornado warnings all around, all around us, so you're forgiven. But if you were here um, at our first Wednesday that we're doing, the first Wednesday in February, March, April, and May, we're meeting in here, and the adults are, that is. Uh, Justin Graves unpacked this text and did a great job. He focused on verses 7 and 8. And we're going to focus on verses 1 through 6. Here we go. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, that Satan, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tr any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but, stipulation, but God did give a condition and here it is. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And watch this. 
you must not touch it. You must not touch it or you will die. Verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows, for God knows, this is a half-truth, by the way. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and they were, and you will be like God, and that's a rather cunning enticement, knowing good and evil. And they would know good and evil, but they were not intended to know good and evil. Okay, let's transition to verses 6 and following. And when the woman saw that the, tree, that the fruit from the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And we often give Eve a real hard time here. But guys, I want you to pay attention to where Adam was. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her. Adam was right next to her, and he ate it. Translation, he was not leading. If anything, he was a passive leader, but he was not providing the leadership that he should have been providing. He jumped right in there with her. Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them, sure enough, were opened, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. That was the first time that happened. The reason they realized they were naked was sin. Notice a couple of other first. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord, the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord. First time they ever hid from God. Among the trees of the garden. They hid from God because of sin. Uh, verses 9 and um, through 11. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? Notice he's asking Adam this question. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid and I was naked. That's a first. Why would you be afraid? You've had such a close relationship with the Lord. It was unhindered until this moment. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And there you have it. History was changed from that moment forward. Well, exactly what can we learn from this old familiar text regarding our desires? I've broken this down into just two lessons this morning. Two. First, lesson number one. Sin causes our desires to appear much shinier than they actually are. Let's just walk back through how Satan, the serpent, tempted Adam and Eve. You ready? Here's what he said to her. You will not surely die if you eat fruit from that tree. For God knows that you will be like him, and your eyes will be opened, and you will see. You'll be like God. You will see as God sees. And all that was true, but it was not God's plan. It was not what he intended. And then I want you to notice how our senses play into yielding to a desire that is not of the Lord. Now, notice what um, Adam and Eve both did. The Bible says that she looked at the forbidden fruit. If you look at a certain food long enough, you're going to do what? You're going you're to eat it, right? Well, she looked, and then she was still, and Adam was too, and they listened. They listened to the pitch. Now, I had a buddy of mine tell me one time, if you don't want to buy the timeshare, or if you don't want to buy the new truck, then stop listening to the sales pitch, all right? If you, if you don't want to buy it, because if you stay there long enough, you're going to buy it. So they looked they listened, and then they stepped completely over the line. They, they stepped over the line when they ate the forbidden fruit. And then sure, they could see. And sure, they recognized they were naked. But that also separated their relationship with God because the Bible says that they were afraid. They were afraid. They heard God walking. That had never happened before. So, remember this, friend. I want you to remember this next takeaway. What you want isn't always what you need. What you want isn't always what you need. Sometimes we get the two confused. And Adam certainly and Eve certainly did not see the full picture and ramifications of their choices. What happened at that moment changed history forever. 
And if you're a parent or a grandparent here, or maybe your parent has said this to you, and you wonder why your parent wigs out or your guardian wigs out when you're about to make a decision, they're like, whoa, 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 don't make that call. Don't make that decision. I've done that before. It will not work out good. It's going to be terrible. Let me just save you the pain. Let me save you the consequences. Do not do that. Do not do that. What you want isn't always what you need. Culture will invite you to meet a God-given need in a way that will harm your relationship with the Lord, yourself, as well as other people people. And shortcuts will never yield eternal fruit. Shortcuts will never yield eternal fruit. And many wants come disguised as needs. And we live in a culture where it tells us that we need lots of things to be satisfied and happy. And that's why people make a lot of money on advertisements. And that's why um, a Super Bowl ad costs millions and millions of dollars for 30 seconds because they know if they pay that money and you watch that commercial that you're going to buy their product because your, your life will not be fulfilled unless you get that product. <clears throat> now, many of you know that I am the minority in the sorority in my house. I'm the only dude, all right? And we have a family dog, and he's a guy, but he's so not loyal, and he doesn't count. And, he, I mean, if I raise my voice, and he jumps in between me and the girls, as if I'm fixing to, you know, go crazy on somebody or whatever. But anyway, he's not a loyal animal, all right? So let's, let's, that, I digress. But it's just me in the house, me and a bunch of girls. So I'm the, I'm the minority in the sorority. And, um, you know, oftentimes if you hear like a wife or a daughter tell their, their dad or their husband this, this next phrase, you're thinking, man, they're, <laughs> they're in trouble. If you hear this phrase, bounce your eyes, bounce your eyes, what do you think? All of you know, you're looking at a pretty girl, you're going to get in trouble, you better bounce your eyes, keep your eyes on the road, young man. But in my house, it's a little bit different. Especially if one of my girls say that. If they say, Daddy, bounce your eyes. It's because I'm looking at a really smoking, hot, good looking, wait for it, wait for it, pickup truck. And I mean, I have got like, you know, it just catches my eye and it's hard, it's hard not to look. And then it's hard not to stare. And you know this is true, right? You know it's true. And so one of my girls will say something to the effect of this. They'll say, Daddy, be happy with your truck. It runs fine. It, it, it's paid for. Plus you have two girls to put through college. Be responsible. Be responsible. And so I am, I am. I, they have two college funds, and I'm being responsible, and I wash my truck because I want to make sure I take good care of it. But when the desire is such, and it pulls me there, and sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. You know what I do? I just call one of my buddies up. Sometimes I just walk across the street. Sometimes it's you. And I'll just say, hey, you mind if I just sit in your new truck for just a minute? If you trust me, could I maybe drive it for a second? I don't know. Around the block? 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes? And then I just soak in all the new truck smell. And I'm good for six months. I'm good for six months. You know, it's interesting, this culture that we live in. It tells us that we need all these extra things to be happy, and we don't. Because what you want isn't always what you need. What you want isn't always what you need. And you can play this out in all kind of different ways. The, the guy that sees the pretty co-worker and thinks, well, if I just flirt just a little bit, and then before long that baits him to the edge and he steps over the line and his life falls apart. Or the person that's like, you know what, if I just take a little bit of extra money from the company this month, that's not going to be a big deal. I mean, I deserve it. I've worked hard. So what you need isn't all, what you want rather isn't always what you need. Be careful with your desires. They're God-given, but the enemy can twist them. And so you need to understand what God expects from you. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two. Either our desires will control us, either they will, or we'll let God control our desires. Back to the text. What happened to Adam and what happened to Eve? I want you to notice 
the progression of the temptation and how the serpent, Satan, used a God-given desire and he twisted it to be met in an unhealthy, ungodly way. He appealed to their sight and then to what they were hearing and then ultimately to what they tasted. And we know that the desire won out. And so what I want you to understand is that we do not get to play the role of victim here. We do not get to say, well, you just don't understand because, man, I have got a, I've got a vice. You know, we all have vices. We all have things that we like to do. I don't know. And, um, and I, just, I just can't let it go. I just can't let that go. And it's true that some of us have vices that pull us in this direction, and some of us have vices that pull us in this direction. For some people, it may be spending too much money or shopping too much or buying things we don't need. For others, it may be, I don't know, it could be gambling. You fill in the blank. But either desire will win out or God will win out. But we don't get to play the role of victim. Why? Because Jesus Christ didn't go to the cross to die in our place, to be raised again on the third, third, third day for us to be victims, but rather victorious in him. The Bible tells us we have had, we've gained victory through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Moreover, we don't get to play that my mom or my dad or my siblings or my whatever, they, they modeled for me something and I just can't, you know, that's just kind of how I was raised. And so, you know, I just can't help that deal. That doesn't fly either because we're a grand new cre a creation in Christ Jesus. We learned that verse a couple of weeks ago. Old things have passed away. All things have been made what? New in Christ. And so either our desires will control us or we'll let our God control our desires. That's how that shakes out every single time. So either we will yield to our best or God's best. And I think the best news today that I'm going to give you is that you get to choose what that, which one you pick. Nobody can make that call for you. You get to pick which one of those desires will, you know, will win out. Now, please note, this is a very slippery slope. Because what seems like an innocent vice one day can turn into something that just controls your life. Maybe it's one of those deals where, you know what, you only participate in a certain vice when you go on the guy's trip or the girl's trip. And then when life gets hard or business gets stressful or the marriage is rocky, all of a sudden you're turning to that vice every weekend or maybe every day just to unwind. And I've mentioned this to you before, but the thing that controls you enslaves you. The thing that controls you enslaves you. So be very careful with just saying, well, I'm just going to do this one time or once a year or twice a year because before long, that can be one of those deals that it just grabs a hold of your life. Our best or God's best, we get to choose. Now, what determines, what determines which one of those we choose? What's the, what's the factors that's going to tip the scale in God's favor, not our favor. I've discovered in my own life two things, and I don't have these on the screen, but I'm just going to give these to you. Just, just two items. The first I, is, is just surrender. And I learned this from a pastor years ago in a pastor's conference, and a very well-known guy, and a very respected man, former president of our national convention. And I remember him, somebody asking him from the audience, it was a Q&A deal, and they said, how do you start your day, Dr. So-and-so? How do you start your day? He said, almost every day I start my day the same way. When I get out of bed, I hit my knees. And the first thing I say is, God, this is your private, then his name, so-and-so reporting for duty. I'm the lowest ranking official that you have, and I will go wherever you tell me to go, and I will do whatever you tell me to do. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good. He surrenders back to God every day. The, the late Oswald Chambers, a devotional writer of years ago, said that we ought to have a daily conversion. Well, that's what that is. It doesn't mean you get saved all over again every day. It simply means you surrender back to God. You surrender back to Him and you report for duty every day. And I've added to that. And through the years, I have, um, I have added this, this list begins to grow. But the first thing I surrender back to God every day is my thought life. My thought life. I want to make sure that my thoughts honor God and are pure. The second thing is what I listen to. Now, when I say listen, I, I can, conversation, sure. Music, yeah. And I kind of have a rule there regarding listening, what I listen to. Uh, because of what I do, I will not listen to anybody else talk about another church or another minister negatively. As a matter of fact, I don't walk away from that conversation. I confront the person and tell them if they have something to say to that person, they ought to call them and have the private conversation. I don't, I don't go there. 
And if anybody ever says anything negatively against you, guess what I do? Exact same thing. Because you don't develop a healthy culture by talking about people behind their back. You develop a healthy culture by being open and honest with God and one another. So that's just kind of a little bit of a sidebar. But I surrender my thought life to God. I surrender what I listen to every day. Number three, the words I say, my speech, I want to make sure I'm that guy that's an encourager, not a, a, a discourager. And then so what I, think about, what, I look, what I think about, what I look at, what I say, my feet and where I go, the work that I do, my, kind of the work that I do, and then my attitude and my motives. I want my attitude to honor God, um, Philippians 2.5. Let the attitude that was in Christ Jesus be also in you. And then my motives, I want my motives to please God, Ephesians 5.10. Find out what pleases the Lord. And the Bible says in, um, in Galatians um, 5.16, your memory verse last week, so all of you know this, it tells us that we should walk, live, and step with the Spirit. That just simply means we obey the Word of God. And when you do that, it means you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's what I call trench work. That's Galatians 5.16. Live and step with the Spirit. In other words, when you read it, you obey it. When you read it, you obey it. And then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's one thing I do to make sure I'm getting God's best. I surrender. The next thing is focus, is focus. Now we know that Adam and Eve didn't focus, so we won't gang up on them, but we know they lost their focus. The psalmist put it like this in Psalm 121, 1 through 2. I will lift my eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from my maker of heaven and earth. And so that's where I want my focus to be. I want my focus to be, I want my focus to be on God's, on, on, on God's um, goal for my life. And I want you to remember this. God's best will never ask you to violate the Word of God. So when He, call, when he, when he calls you to His best, He's never going to ask you to do anything that will violate His Word. He's just not going to do that. He's just not going to do that. He's not going to ask you to, to leave your family and, all right, well, I feel God telling me I ought to leave my wife and go run over here. No, that's not God. That's Satan, okay? So God's not going to ask you to violate um, his word. I just finished a book for like the fourth time because I'm taking several groups through this book called Didn't See It Coming by Kerry Norwig. Seven issues um, every man faces or every person faces and the solutions therein. And at the very end of that book, he talks about um, emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence, and there's five components, and I don't have time to get into all of them, but the first is the most important. It is chief, and it's self-awareness. It's important that we are self-aware, that we are self-aware of how we project, how we present ourselves, because we attract what we project, right? And so we need to make sure the tone that we use the words that we say, and we need to be aware of how they're affecting the people around us. Are we the person in the group that's the complainer, or are we the encourager? Are we the discourager, or are we the one that lifts people up? We want to be the person that lifts people up. And so I want to surrender, and I want to focus. Hey, guess where I learned? Guess where I learned to maintain my focus? Believe it or not, it was not in graduate school. And it really pains me to say this, but it wasn't even at the great Southern Miss to the top where I graduated from. It wasn't there either. It was on a pitching mound when I was a little boy. You see, from the time that I grew up, I played whatever sport was in season. That's just kind of the communities I grew up in. And whatever was in season hunting, that's what you did. That's just kind of the life that I grew up with. And from a very early age, around eight or nine, where I lived, they had, they had team pitch where the, you know, the guy, the kids got to pitch, not the coaches. And from my early, early age, I was a pitcher and a catcher. And so when I was not pitching, I was catching the other guy that was pitching, and we would kind of switch back and forth. But I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but there was a time when the parents of the opposing team would say not-so-kind things about the other players to distract them. We call that in 2020 heckling. They would heckle kids. And there was this one particular team that would, their parents would pick me me, little old me, little old me, and heckled me, and I got rattled. And when I got rattled, I got rocked for you non-baseball people that means they scored several runs off of me. And I, got, I went into the dugout, man, I was steamed. I was mad. Sure you weren't angry? No, I was mad. And I'm sure I threw a few things, and I'm sure I said a few things I shouldn't have said, and the coach pulled me aside, and he pulled my catcher aside where it was just us, and he says, you two listen to me right now. 
I'm going to teach you how to maintain your focus, which has helped me learn how to embrace God's best. And here's what he said to me. Mark, when you take that mound, I do not want your eyes to leave Joey. That was my catcher. He's going to be in a standing position. He's going to get the signal from the dugout. Don't you shake the sign off. I know what pitch you ought to be throwing. You commit to the pitch even if you don't want to throw it. Yes, sir. And whenever he gets down into his catcher position, he's going to give you the sign. I don't want you to look at the batter. I don't want you to look at the umpire. I don't want you to look at me. I want you to focus on the mitt. Joey, your indicator to get him zoned in is fist in the mitt. When you hear fist in the mitt, you clear your mind and you say focus on the pitch and the mitt. Did it work? Oh, yeah. It worked. It worked. Well, what happened when you didn't focus? Well, I hit a few batters. But other than that, it went really, really well. But more times than not, I was locked in and focused. And what I did was just take that into big people world. Does it always work? It always works if I work it. And except for now, I'm not looking at Joey and his catcher's mitt. I'm looking at the Lord. Because the Bible says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and now sits down at the right hand of the Father, and he makes intercession for you and for me. It's either going to be God's best, or it's going to be your best, and nobody makes that call for you but you. So choose wisely. Let's bring this home with a question. When is the last time you've given what you wanted a reality check? Now, what does a reality check mean? It simply means when is the last time you got steel, Psalm 4610 steel, you got steel before God and says, God, are my wants and my desires what you want for my life? Is this career what you want for me? Is this friendship what you want for me? And then you're still long enough to listen, and it's been my experience that he's always spoken to me during that time. So your homework for the day, when you go home this afternoon, give your wants, your desires, a reality, just a simple reality check. And then just remember what we learned last weekend. You bring those desires before God and you present them to Him. And you say, God, here are my desires. And you allow spiritual disciplines, or you allow the Word of God to inform those desires. And then you allow spiritual disciplines, prayer, Bible study, journaling, fasting, worship. You allow those spiritual disciplines to reshape those desires. And here's what you're going to discover. You're going to discover a God more loving and generous than you ever imagined on the other side. But most importantly, church... You're going to begin to want what God wants for you. And I would submit to you as your pastor that if you are a child of God, if you're a Christian today, you will never have peace of heart and you will never have peace of mind until you yield to God's best, not your best. The only way to experience the abundant life, the blessed life of God, is to embrace His best, not our best. And that, that is the backstory behind the power of desires. The problem with desires. And our desires should make our life better, not worse. And we have a responsibility to make those choices that will usher us in to His best. Choose wisely. Let's pray. Lord, you're good. And we're humbled that you allow us to have the freedom, yes, the freedom to worship you with no fear of someone hindering us today, God, from doing that. So thank you that we live in a country that we can worship you. And thank you that we take a few minutes at the end of our service to process what we've heard. And so, Lord, help us to do that right now, to, to, to just to zone in on what it is that you would have us to do when we leave here. Help us to spend the next couple of minutes processing that. In Christ's name we pray, amen.